Hey, this is Pete the Planner, USA Today money columnist and host of the Ask Pete the Planner podcast. When I'm not fixing the weirdest financial situations you've ever heard of, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and man, oh man, is today going to be a great day in the basement. First, it's the annual company bowling outing. B, my annual calendar of crazy holidays arrives today. And three, we're joined by the woman who wanted a 401k plan so bad, she gave free classes about it at her work. Please welcome the host of the Oh My Dollar podcast, Lillian Karabayak. Plus, will traditional retirement planning still work? One of our headlines today says it won't. And a new TransferWise study discloses lots of bank fees you might want to know about. But that's not all. We're throwing out the Haven Lifeline today to ask about a financial coaching business. Is that a viable job? Probably not as good as podcast announcing, but we'll ask the guys. And now, two guys who are the so-called financial coaches on this podcast, Joe and O J J J J G. You ever coach anything? Um, let me think. No, I, I was. No, I can't. I can't do that. I was my kid's soccer coach. That was good. Yeah, you you would you'd be way too t- talking about surly. No, that's I, I barely like my children. I'm not sure that I would like a whole <laughs> gaggle of other people's children. Hey, welcome to the Stacking Benjamin Show, everybody. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across this card table from me, a guy who is also on Twitter and awfully damn proud of it. The one and only OG. Sometimes I'm on Twitter. That sounds like a really good tagline for our show. I barely like other people's children. <laughs> Or I barely like my children, let alone other people's. Stacky Benjamin, the show hosted by the dude who barely likes his own children. <laughs> right. But you know what you do like, OG? You like our X bars. Mmm. Thanks to our X bar for supporting Stacky Benjamins. Our X bar is the fuel I go to after my morning rut. It's a whole food protein bar with no BS. Get 25% off your first order, rxbar.com slash SB. Use the promo code SB, that's rxbar.com, SB, promo code SB when you're at checkout. You know, you can't be healthy in the wallet if you don't have a healthy mind, right? Healthy body. Got to have the whole package, OG. The thing I like about those the most is how you can eat well on the run. Grab it, throw it in your backpack. Done. And this episode of Stacking Benjamin is also brought to you by Lexington Law. Talk about getting your health in order. How about if you get your credit in order? For a free credit report summary and a credit repair consultation, head to lexingtonlaw.com slash SB. And we've got Lillian Karabek here. There is, uh, she likes to dress like David Bowie. She enjoys finding a way to do every crazy job on earth. And uh, she has a brand new financial planning book which involves a lot of cats. You a cat guy? Used to be, until he decided to use my basement as a litter box. And then, and then you became an ex-cat guy. Yeah, never own anything that eats while you sleep. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that, but I do know we've got... It's true. I do There's know... nothing to do with it. Just <laughs> embrace it is what you're supposed to do with we've that. We've got headlines right now, so let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from Market Watch. This piece is written by Mark Yager. Traditional retirement planning isn't going to cut it. Do this instead. If there weren't a more clickbaity title on earth, I said, okay, what is it that I have to do instead? And I thought that I'd ask you this. The retirement you saw your grandparents or even your parents live through will likely not be the retirement you choose for yourself. Consider the following. In 1900, the average life expectancy was 47. Only 100,000 Americans lived to 85. By 2010, though, OG, the number of people over 85 years old has grown to 5.5 million and was one of the fastest growing segments of our population. By 2030, as the last baby boomers turned 65, older adults are expected to reach 20% of the population. And by 2050, 19 million people are going to be in the 85 and older age group. 
The point is clear. People are generally healthier and living longer than ever before. Those with better than average education and access to health care will likely beat the longevity averages and many will live well into their 90s. They then talk about why people will live for a long time. Most traditional financial planning tends to focus on achieving goals throughout life, culminating in something called retirement. But planning for what happens and what you want to do during retirement is often lacking. The word retire actually means to withdraw or retreat, which may have been the case after 65 many decades ago, but that's the opposite of what most people reaching 65 want to do today. So instead, he talks about picturing your life in overlapping 25-year time spans and then thinking about what you're doing during those time spans. No such thing as retirement anymore, OG. No retreat, no surrender. Instead, we're on the attack doing different things in these overlapping 25-year segments of our life. What do you think about that? I like it. Plus, I think that that kind of no-go years of what we envisioned our retirement to be or what our parents or maybe more specifically in my case, grandparents' retirement looked like where you just kind of sit around on the rocking chair. That happens still, but I think what he's saying is that this happens 25 years later than it used to. It now happens in the 90s where it used to happen in your mid-60s. Yeah. And so now from 60 to 90, you've got to fill that 25-year gap with other stuff uh, before you get to the rock and chair time. He talks about how people change too. And it's funny, as part of this, I know very well. So children are grown, tuition payments have ended, mortgages are nearly paid off. I've got those three. Career duties may have become less rewarding or stale. <laughs> <laughs> well, true I'm not, so far. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure about the last one. I actually enjoy what I do, but you begin to think about what's- it's definitely pretty stale. But, 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 but it does stale to other people. You begin, oh, it's, it's, it's as, you begin to think about what's next. You are ready for more flexibility and the chance to explore what else life has to offer. You also have a greater perspective on what's important in your life. You know, we've seen these studies about how many people that are going through this transition phase actually need psychological. There are psychologists who spend their entire career dealing with people that have a hell of a time making that transition. Well, I think it's really important to know that what you think is really cool and exciting and fun to do when you're in your 20s is not going to be what you think is cool, exciting and fun to do when you're in your 40s. You and I were just having this conversation the other day about uh, accumulating stuff and you're going through this house project that's going on right now. And all of it's about you and your spouse's utility. Right. And you said to me kind of offhand, but you said, hey, all I want to do is just be comfortable and travel and like see the world. That may not have been what you wanted to do five or eight years ago when your kids were still in high school. And, you know, at that point in time, it was swim practice and soccer games. That's true. Know, so. I, I mean, I realize completely my, my goals are, are much more, Way different. M- and much more simple, right? Yeah. My goals are much more simple and much more clearly defined, which is funny. Cause you know, we get letters from people that are in their early thirties saying, I don't know what I want to do during retirement. Or, and, and I think to this point, set yourself up for these 25 year timeframes, you know, set yourself up for this flexibility, which is, which is part of the thing we talk about taxes that drives me crazy. You know, people always say one tax shelter over another one. To your point, you don't know what the hell you're going to want 15 to 20 years from now. Why are you making decisions about which tax structure is going to be best now when you don't know your withdrawal scheme later on? I think I want to leave things open for a a withdrawal scheme that makes sense later. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of flexibility. Uh, I like that piece. Uh, We'll link to that in our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. And uh, on our second piece, I received a new study Commissioned by TransferWise. We actually had TransferWise on last year talking about how they do international money transfers and help people avoid tons of uh, markup fees when people are transferring money internationally. Mm-hmm. But they took a look at bank fees. And, and this, is, this is just amazing. Some of the bank fees that TransferWise found that people don't know anything about. First of all, seven in 10 Americans would rather drive 10 extra minutes to avoid an ATM operated by their bank than pay an out-of-network ATM fee. People don't know the value of time, but okay. Well, maybe not the value of time, but look at how high that fee is versus the amount of gasoline you're going to spend. I was just talking to a friend of mine the other day. We, we were actually talking about this exact same thing. And I said, why don't you just go to the grocery store and you know, buy an Apple and use your debit card and just do the cash back? And he says, what are you talking about? So are you kidding me? Didn't even know you could do it. It's the easiest ATM trick in the world, and people haven't even heard of it. Another 65% would rather have their credit card decline than be charged an overdraft fee. I totally would. Oh, really? No, no, no. no. Overdraft me, baby. Are you kidding me? And pay that huge overdraft fee? What if you're at the grocery store using our 
prior example, and you're trying to buy an apple. Okay. And they decline your card. You're like, I can't eat, but at least I don't have a fee. Uh, I, I totally don't care. I mean, I, mean, I would, I'll find a different way. As if, as if you have a, a cupboard that's completely bare. I don't want, <laughs> I don't want this this stupid forty dollar fee. I'd rather suffer the embarrassment. I mean, give me but the. I, think, I was gonna say, I think nowadays isn't most stuff again using technology, right? If your checking and savings account aren't linked to provide that buffer, then, you know. Yeah, but there's people listening to the show. I remember my early 20s, and it's funny because uh, I was reading a story about Mark Cuban the other day. Mark Cuban had the same problem. I, Mark Cuban and I, we have a lot in common, of course. <laughs> you guys have a lot in common. Yes, yeah. yes. No, yeah, I'm not, I'm just name dropping here. He's me, going through a house remodel too, I think. <laughs> me and Mark, you know, me and my buddy Mark. So but, I was hanging out with Mark. But this, this story, he said in his early 20s, he had a hell of a time staying out of debt, staying on the right side of positive. I did too. I remember, I remember overdraft fees. Just, I would just start to get my act together and then I'd, I'd get slammed with this overdraft fee. And then because the overdraft fee wasn't paid the next day, then I get another fee because my account's negative. And then you get, and then you get fee on top of fee on top of fee, which was, yeah. I learned very quickly how to hate bank of America, by the way, bank of America taught me how to hate bank of America. Just, just to, just to let you know. There he goes. That sponsorship opportunity. There there it went. But I would totally rather be embarrassed. I'd rather have this checkout clerk look at me and go, sir, your card was declined. And I'll go, huh, okay, well, we'll figure that out later. See you later. Hmm. I'd much rather have that than pay a probably, bunch of money. Probably, you're right. You're probably. Men, 69% are slightly more likely than women to choose a decline card over an overdraft fee. That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> more, more men just don't give a damn. Over, over half of those surveyed, 55%, report they've asked and had their bank waive fees for them in the past. That's something most people don't do. Yeah. I used to work at a bank way long time ago, like before everything. There's a lot of latitude that bank tellers and even higher up bank managers have, especially if you've got a longer relationship with the uh, institution. If you make a mistake or two, they're likely to look the other way, especially if you just ask for Just ask. Just one of those things with like yeah, credit card late fees or interest rates. You call them and say, hey, this interest rate's really high. Is there, can we lower it? I mean, what's the worst that they say is? No. no, right. There's no downside. Millennials very savvy when it comes to reward point fees. In fact, nine out of 10 were aware they existed before they were charged, while less than half, 46% of 35 to 55-year-olds and a quarter, 26% of 55-plus-year-olds knew about this fee. Reward point fees. So you're getting a reward points but you're getting fees for your reward points. How about that one? Okay. So maybe we should go through what some of these uh, banking fees are because this is, I thought this was interesting. So there's bank fees people expect and bank fees people don't expect. And the bank fees people didn't expect, 45% didn't expect reward point fees. 57% didn't expect returned mail fees. Oh, those are fun. 37% didn't expect paper statement fees. Mm-hmm. 35% didn't anticipate a fee to close your account. That one get that's like the kick in the ass when you're leaving the bank. Hey, don't never come back. Yeah. I just got one the other day on my checking account. I got an email that said you've made too many transfers out of your savings account this month. Too We're many tra- charge you 10 bucks. Too many transfers out. Mm-hmm. 34% didn't anticipate minimum balance fees and 32%, of course, it would be transfer wise that they didn't have 32% didn't expect international money transfer fees. If you're if you're going abroad, make sure that your credit card, by the way, has no foreign transaction fees. That's a big one. Yep. Good good stuff. Thanks to Transferwise for that one. We'll have a link to them in our show notes at stackybedjamins.com. I think the lessons are number one, look for all the bank fees at your bank. And uh and I wouldn't be afraid of a little bit of embarrassment over those overdraft charges. I'm still think I'm on the right side of that ball. Oh gee. And then the se- the second one is uh, traditional retirement planning. Plan on living a lot longer, a lot more active, and it, retirement is not retreat. It's not retreat. You're still active. Lillian Karabek, OG, getting ready to come down to the basement. This woman has done everything as she's going to, I'm sure, explain today. Uh, she's the host of the Oh My Dollar podcast. She has worked, well, tons of jobs. I first heard about Lillian when I heard this amazing story about what she what she did at work. Without further ado, let's just talk to her. Let's talk about if you don't have what you want, 
reach out and get it. And coming down the stairs, the host of the Oh My Dollar podcast and also the author of the incredible book focusing not on cats, but on getting your money together, <laughs> Lillian Karabek joins us. How are you, man? I'm great. Well, I'm so glad that you're here with me. Why cats? Why cats? Because I think that if you can take something that people find unpleasant and scary and then add something they find fun, you've got a really winning idea. <laughs> but what do you do with the people that don't find cats fun? I find they, I, I the find book isn't for them. <laughs> <laughs> Define your audience, right? One of the major backers of my Kickstarter was like, doesn't like cats because they're pointy on both sides. But she was like, but I like them in print. So I think a lot of people find cats cute, even if they don't like them in real life. I want to get to some ideas from the book here in a few minutes. But first, you had a great story that our mutual friend Karen told me that I absolutely love. You were in a 401k plan and nobody was using it. So you decided, <laughs> like, I feel like you're like a, a Walker, Texas Ranger, <laughs> like taking control and making sure that your 401k gets used. Tell me the story. Nobody's using your 401k. So what did you do? I was so excited. I worked at a mid-sized nonprofit. So we had 30 employees and we ran a bike shop. I was so excited at my first job ever with a 401k because I'm a nerd. But we weren't allowed to use it until a year in. And so I marked it on my calendar. And the day that I was at my year anniversary, I emailed the person that played HR and was like, hey, I'm, I'm eligible for the 401k now. Like, let me in. And uh, I've been contributing to it for like six months. And they came up to me and went, Lillian, you are the only one using it out of 30 employees. And it is costing us like, you know, like $750 a year, like not a crazy amount of money, but it's an unreasonable subsidy to one, one staff member. Did you and, ever find uh, out that why you're the only one using it? What, like, I, like, why was nobody else using it? There was no matching. Okay. So there wasn't a ton of advantages over an IRA. But here's the thing. I can tell you, knowing all my coworkers, none of them were also saving in, a, in an IRA, right? So <laughs> it wasn't like they were like, oh, rationally, I should, I should have an IRA. Like it, it was like nobody was saving for retirement at all. And our average person there was like in their late 20s, early 30s, like perfect time to start saving for retirement. None of us made super great money because it was a nonprofit. But I begged them. I was like, please don't take the 401k away. I was already maxing out my Roth. So I was going to be like, I was going to pay a lot more taxes if I didn't have the 401k. And so I started teaching personal finance classes to my coworkers as an extra thing after work, just to like try to convince them that they should join the uh, 401k. But if they're and not managed to save it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, well, well, wait a minute. I wanted, you had spoiler there, but hold on. Uh, uh, how did you get people to come or did people actually come? Did, did, did you offer them like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Did you have <laughs> I did offer snacks. Um, I, the, you know, we ran a bike shop as well as a nonprofit. So like there was a ton of coordination involved in having something that worked for people that worked retail hours as well as people who work uh, nine to five hours. But it turns out that most people are con like most people in their late 20s feel like they should be doing money better, but they don't really know what they should be doing. And if you offer them some sort of like easy, like it's at your office, I'm just going to worst case scenario is that you wasted two hours and you got some free snacks. Like, please come. And it ended up being a really excellent class and kind of got me started in doing this more and more. You said it didn't it didn't save it, though. No, it did save it. It did save it. Uh, it did not increase participation very much because we didn't have matching. And by the end of the class, I taught everybody they should probably have an IRA. <laughs> nice. Good. <laughs> so I kind of was working against my own interests. But what's, um, but what's bad about the IRA is that, I mean, if these people don't know how to save, the cool thing about saving through work is they get to save your payroll deduct. Like the easiest thing to do is just have it taken out of your payroll and you're teaching somebody that doesn't save already not to do that. Nice job. Well, and the other awesome thing is if you're low income and you do the 401k, then you can qualify for the savers credit. And almost everyone at my job made so uh, little money that you would lower your adjusted gross income and then you can get the savers credit. So yes. I spent like a portion of the class being like the government will literally pay you to save for retirement. <laughs> like yeah. you make less than 30,000 a year. It's uh, almost like it's almost like the government's not or excuse me, your your company's not matching you. The government is. Right. Yeah. Like that. It's essentially, it's like a really good match too. Right. It's like a 50% match. Right. 
yeah. So I, I did get a lot of people. I had people like calling me. I had been a tax preparer before I had had that job. And I, I had people calling me that had taken the class on when they were filing their taxes on TurboTax and were like, hey, I want to make sure I get that credit thing that you're saying. Like, how do I do this? We walk me through it and like acted as like tech support for my coworkers when they were doing TurboTax filing. But um, you have all the you have all the nerd jobs. Oh, well, I also have a lot of non nerd jobs. I had 40 jobs in my 20s. I was recently adding it up which is speaks to the fact that I usually have three to five jobs at a given time. Right now I have four, but I just like working and I tend to have really poorly paid jobs and I tend to have jobs with really whimsical job titles like vegan pastry goddess. I was a bicycle valet. Like I literally parked bikes as a valet. I was a database wizard. That was my actual job title. I like the wizard part of that. Did you like, was that your negotiation was making sure that they put wizard on the end of that? You're like, I'll do it if you put wizard on. In nonprofits, it's quite common that like, because they pay you so poorly, they give you benefits that cost them no money, like a cool title. But if you have all these skills, why not get rid of the four jobs, go for one job that pays significantly higher? Is it loving the people, loving the, the nonprofit work? What is it? Um, some of it is that I, I think I might be unemployable in like a corporate environment. <laughs> I mean, like my job now is I dress up like Bowie and I teach people about personal finance with cats. Like, like I, if you find me a corporation that wants to hire me to do that, that would be excellent. <laughs> yeah. You don't, you don't have IBM calling going. That's what we need. Right. I've never seen an in, indeed.com job listing for like personal finance instructor. So yeah, I don't, I just, my jobs tend to be in pretty like low paid fields, but I've always been frugal. And so it's, you know, it's not been a problem. I made $30,000 a year at my most recent, like full-time job where I still had three other jobs on the side and, uh, and I had saved 59% of my income. So. It, it, which is pretty amazing, especially when you're working low paid jobs, Lily. And in the fourth chapter of your book, you talk about burying that treasure, learning to love savings. Clearly you love saving. How do you teach other people to love saving money? I think so many of the people that come to Oh My Dollar are around my age and they've been told that essentially like all millennials should panic about money and that we're all screwed and that the boomers screwed us. A lot of us get stuck in this narrative that we're totally screwed over with money before we've even started. And I like to see savings as kind of this antidote to all of that money stress that has been put upon us before we're even necessarily in a bad financial situation, right? There's a lot of like cultural norms that we've been given about what, how, how money is supposed to work for us and that we're all buried in debt, even if we're not necessarily all buried in debt and that we're like, you know, the job market is stagnant and we're never going to have jobs and saving is like, it's a, it's totally a superpower because most Americans don't save. And if you manage to save Like you've got the ability to just walk away. (laughs) I I was working a super toxic political job during the 2016 presidential election, like sleep under my desk, 80 hours a week, did not like it. And there was just no expectation that I would be able to leave the job. Like most of my coworkers were not happy either, but they didn't have any savings. But I, I was able to just say like, I'm, I need to leave this. I would rather be happy then continue to work this job. And I had 18 months expenses in cash. So I was able to do that. See, that's the thing I think is that, you know, you talk about having low paying jobs. You can have whatever job you want if you control your spending and have savings. Yeah. I didn't let my lifestyle inflate because I never really had a job that encouraged (laughs) lifestyle inflation. (laughs) But also like I did two years in AmeriCorps and I still managed to save money when I was in AmeriCorps where you get paid $800 a month. And, That's incredible. Uh, Tell me that number one more time, because this I, is an amazing I number. Two thousand dollars by the end of my eleven month term in AmeriCorps, and I made eight hundred bucks a month. That 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 just is. How did you do that? Well, you do get so you do get food stamps. So essentially, I got like one hundred and fifty dollars a month for food, and other than that, I lived in a collective house. So I had I had ten roommates, <laughs> and I had like a roommate in my room. So my rent was cheap, and I rode a bike to work. And I worked at a bike nonprofit, so that was kind of obvious. <laughs> uh, but, but that's uh, but that's funny. We had two. We had uh, Scott Trench on the show from Bigger Pockets, and he was talking last year about your two biggest expenses, and you named them both: your housing and your auto. And bam, you took care of both of those right away, and was able to keep costs down. 
Yeah. Well, and then the rent we had to re, it was a collectively owned house and we had to refinance and the rent was going to go up. And I just was so used to paying so little in rent that, uh, I ended up deciding to build a geodesic dome made of cardboard and bubble wrap. And I lived in a geodesic dome that I built myself in the backyard of a different collective house so that I could keep my rent at a hundred a month. (laughs) People listening to this are like, there's no way this is real. But you didn't just do that. You you worked as an adult dancer for a while. Yeah, yeah. I was an exotic dancer on and off for years. And then I got actually much more into the, when I went to school for economics, I I got much more into the economic side of it. So I ended up doing a lot of guides and tax prep for strippers, which was like more fun to me than the actual dancing. (laughs) Well, and it's huge. And having adult entertainers as clients, I know those people, and I'm speaking to the choir, you know this, they all live a cash lifestyle. Like like they, they just have tons of cash in their hand at one time and then it's gone. Well, and that's like, that's the big thing to me is that I had to set up systems to make the cash disappear. Like I had to, I did, because cash would just fly through my hands. I'm, because I'm really into spreadsheets, if I use it on my card and I log it, it feels real, more real to me than cash, which is the opposite for some people. But cash just flies away because I I have tips and, you know, if I spend five or $10 out of cash and I don't log it that day, the IRS isn't going to know that I made that five or $10. And like, that's a really slippery slope, right? (laughs) So I have to like immediately hide it from myself. A lot of tattoo artists are the same way and bartenders because they have just so much cash around. Um, And bank robbers. They have a lot of cash around. Well, bank robbers too, right. We got to make sure we, you didn't have that as a job, did you? (laughs) No, no, I did not. That's good. Oh, I would, I would probably have a lot more money if I did. (laughs) I was going to say, keep it on the legal side. But going back to these people with an all cash lifestyle, that how do you get them interested in, in saving? How do you get them to figure out how the heck they're going to, you know, because I feel like they always feel like there's another job right around the corner and I could just make more money tomorrow. You know, I think it really depends on the dancer. A lot of dancers that are kind of career dancers, like in Portland, the average dancer can have a much longer career. Um, we have the most strip clubs per capita here in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> you put that on city. You put that on all your t-shirts. I, we do. <laughs> <laughs> we also have like the most pet cats per capita. So right. I don't know. I was gonna say um, this whole like, this whole beer thing is a sham. The whole foodie <laughs> thing is a sham. It's all to cover up the fact that we really have the most strip clubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have micro brews, trees, rain, and strip clubs. Um, so dancers can have longer careers here, and a lot of people actually see it as a career they can retire from. But wow. that being said, there's a ton of 21 year olds who get into it and don't expect to be, you know, oh, I'm doing this to pay for college, or like I'm gonna, I'm gonna be out of this in six months. And those people often get stuck in the trap of believing like this income doesn't really count. I don't really need to save it because this is a temporary thing. And then I see them and they're still working at a club two or three years later and they haven't filed a tax return in three years. And so one of the things that works really well is having other dancers that have been more career dancers, you know, that are able to work only two days a week because they have the regular clients and that are in their late twenties, which is old for a dancer kind of mentor younger dancers. You really need an example that looks like you to show you what the path can be. And quite frankly, a lot, in a lot of clubs, depending on the club, drug habits tend to be one of the reasons why cash disappears. Right. Um, and so if you appeal to people from this, like, yeah, you can one, like clean up your lifestyle and you can also save money. I think that works really well. It gives people a way out. You know, it's interesting. Even people listening, some people are like, what does this have to do with me? I mean, we've talked about mentorship. We've talked about controlling your cost, <laughs> talk about hiding money from yourself. We've talked about filing tax returns. I mean, these are all important things. The uh, let's It turns w- out we're all humans. Yes. And, isn't and that weird? Like- <laughs> we have way more in common than we think we do. We all have the same risk profile. It's just that some of us have different occupations. I want to talk about your Kickstarter for a second because I mentioned the book just a couple times. It's called Get Your Money Together, an illustrated personal. But I'm see what I did there. See what you did there that I said. Uh, finance workbook to help you budget your money, save for retirement, and smash debt. People might not know what I did there, but it's because there's cats all over your book. The, uh, who did the illustrations? Fiona, who is an illustrator that only does cats. So the cats are extra adorable and a ton of the cats in the book. So it's illustrated. So there's cats, there's like 50 cats total in the book and they even like 
use their toys to illustrate investing allocations. But a ton of the cats in the book are people who backed the Kickstarter. They were able to get their cat included in the Oh, book. that's cool. Yeah, um, that's awesome. So, yeah, and I like interviewed their cats and, you know, learned some facts about them and everything. It was great. <laughs> I love I love these ideas, the cat tower of financial goals, debt the financial litter box. My favorite though I think is chapter 6, credit the great American laser pointer chase cuz that's hours of fun for our cat. <laughs> Uh, building your fort, housing, uh, getting under the umbrella, insurance. Uh, how did you choose these particular chapters? So a lot of the structure is in many ways very similar to the program that I teach, Get Your Money Together Boot Camp, which is essentially my in-person workshop. I teach it to a lot of youth and to college students. And so I kind of went with the structure of the program and then was like, how do I integrate cats into this? <laughs> which is the whole, it's not about finance at all. It's how do I get the cats in there? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, here's the thing. Most of this personal finance finance stuff isn't rocket science, but it's so emotional for us that we can, a lot of people convince themselves that they can't possibly do it, that they're bad with money because they, they're not good at math or, you know, they were never good at math in school and therefore they're never going to handle their money. But the reality is everybody has to handle money at some point. Even if you like are living on disability income, you still have to like learn budgeting skills. And If you can kind of disarm them with a little bit of felines, it makes a huge difference to to make them realize like, okay, like very small percentage of this is actually math. Most of it is emotional and having conversations with yourself about what your values are and what, what you want your life to look like. And how do we, how do we get the book? Yeah. Ohmydollar.com slash book and it will start shipping in April. So it's a bunch of pre-orders right now, but you'll get the ebook as soon as you click and get it. So Awesome. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about your awesome podcast. You and your co-host, you guys have such a good time at the Oh My Dollar podcast. Tell everybody about that. Yeah. Just look for Oh My Dollar pretty much anywhere that you can find podcasts. And uh, it's a 15 minute on average weekly show. And we deal with we're a call in financial advice podcast. So just like you, we answer, we answer questions for people, but we're not in a basement. No, Actually, we do. We've we got do that record going in a basement. Do you? We, re- we record our radio station is in a basement. You just don't, you just don't <laughs> advertise that you're in a basement. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> you're lost, so, man. Ju- just like this show, we record in a basement. <laughs> it's a perfect segue. <laughs> yes. It's an easy, it's not a stretch. That's good. And of course, it isn't just, uh, it wouldn't be Lillian if it were just, oh, my dollar. It's, oh, my dollar personal finance with a dash of glitter. Oh, yes. So our podcast artwork is me dressed as David Bowie because I dress like David Bowie a lot to teach personal finance. Yeah. So I pretty much anything to disarm people. I have like 12 Bowie costumes because I led a really huge bike ride in Portland for 10 years called Bowie versus Prince. That is like 1500 people dressed as Bowie and Prince riding around having a dance party. So I think that's the perfect place to leave it. (laughs) Lillian, thanks for hanging out with us. Yeah. Thank you so much. (laughs) Hey there, trivia nerds. What a great day. My new holiday calendar just arrived. It's got everything. National say hello to a pig day. And that pretty much every day. The official kiss a shark day. That's a dangerous one. I haven't gotten to the celebrate your neighbor day, but I'm pretty sure it's in there somewhere. Today, though, let's celebrate the fact that calendars help us with time, shall we? Here's today's question about time. What's the colloquial phrase for the amount of time it takes for light to travel a centimeter? I'll be back in a jiffy with the answer in just a moment. No, the answer's not jiffy. We all know that living a healthy lifestyle helps your wallet. Not only are your health care costs less, but also you're able to think more clearly for longer periods of time. And guess what? We need to say a special thank you to RX Bar for supporting Stacking Benjamins. RX Bar is my go-to food after my morning run. It's a whole food protein bar made with 100% whole ingredients and no BS, such as no added sugar, artificial flour, artificial colors, preservatives, or fillers. They're made with a few simple, clean ingredients where every ingredient serves a purpose. For example, egg whites are a main source of its protein that's easy for your body to absorb. They're gluten-free, soy-free, and dairy-free, no added sugar. Our X-Bars come in 11 delicious flavor varieties. This morning, I had blueberry 
It was fantastic. And whether you like it sweet and savory, chocolate, or the fruit flavors, there's an RX bar for you. Real food ingredients actually taste really good. You can actually taste the cocoa, the real fruit, the spices like sea salt. So for breakfast on the go, snack at the office, throwing in your bag for a plane, like we're going to be here in a couple days, tossing in your backpack for a bike ride or a hike, of course, pre or post workout snack like I do. RX bar, 25% off. You're going to get 25% off your first order at rxbar.com forward slash SB. Use promo code SB. That's rxbar.com forward slash SB. And then at checkout, promo code SB. Stacky Benjamins is also supported by Lexington Law. Big thanks to them. We teamed up with Lexington Law and they're offering us all a free credit report summary and credit repair consultation. We talked earlier in the show about getting your financial house in order, and it all starts with a clean credit report and, if you need it, a credit repair consultation. Who does Lexington Law help? Well, anybody looking for a home mortgage, for one, because you don't want a surprise when you go to buy that house, get the credit you deserve. The big benefit of using Lexington Law is they have long-standing relationships with all three of the major credit bureaus and a deep expertise in knowing how to get errors Remove. They know exactly how that works. And that enables their team to communicate more routinely and efficiently on their clients' behalf and with their clients. Lexington Law tackles correcting errors on credit reports through three levels of credit repair to ensure that each client's needs are met. That's Lexington Law for credit repair and peace of mind tomorrow. For a free credit report summary and a credit repair consultation, head to lexingtonlaw.com forward slash SB. That's lexingtonlaw.com and use forward slash SB. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm leafing through my new holiday calendar so I can share them with you on every show. And alongside Ice Cream Lover's Day and National Bass Fishing Day, there's this day called Flag Day and another one called Arbor Day. Those are just weird. How about this one, though? Christmas? Come on. What's that all about? Valentine's Day? These are like obscure things. Nobody's heard of these things. I'm not so sure about this calendar anymore, actually. But hey, enough of that. Let's get today's time-related trivia, which was this. What's the colloquial phrase for the amount of time it takes for light to travel a centimeter? In physics and chemistry, the time required for light to travel a centimeter, also known as a light centimeter, is called a jiffy. What the f***? Are you kidding me? There was no way it was going to be called a jiffy. I just told people it wasn't a jiffy, and now you're telling me it's a jiffy. It must take light a long way to travel a centimeter because Joe's mom is gone forever when I'm in the middle of a story and says she'll be back in a jiffy. That's weird. God, how could it be a jiffy? A jiffy. He told you in the question. Huh. That's the first time that uh, I thought Doug was a little tricky. He's tricky, 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 tricky. Thanks to Lillian Karabik, that woman's done everything. I mean, she's she's done just everything, which proves that, hey, if you want it, go get it. I mean, deciding that you want your 401k bad enough that you're going to teach everybody after work how to use your 401k just so you get to keep yours, <laughs> that's that's taking matters into your own hands, you know? It's a different way to sharpen the axe, that's for sure. It's so exciting. Uh, she's got just a little energy. Hey, let's uh, throw out the Haven Lifeline, OG, and tackle some of life. So our, in this case, life insurance's most important questions. Our friends over at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they're disrupting the life insurance industry by focusing on those two things that you value most. I can tell you it's not bank fees. No, probably not. It's your money or your time. And that's why they created a simple way to buy affordable and dependable term life insurance online. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life Now for a free estimate for coverage and to learn about life insurance the modern way. How about that? The modern way. I feel like it's like 1955. The modern way. Clean your dishes the modern way. Buy your life insurance the modern way. But you know what? Whenever you buy life insurance, don't you kind of feel like it's 1955 when you don't use Haven Life? You're like, really? I got to do what? Why am I answering this question on this forum 47 times, right? Somebody who knows how to ask questions the modern way on our voicemail is our new friend, Abby. Say hi, Abby. Hey, Joe and OG. Great to talk to you. I'm really just calling so you'll 
hopefully send me an awesome circus t-shirt. But I did think of a question as well. My question is, what do you think about financial coaching as a business? As a former and current financial advisor, I'm interested in your perspectives on helping clients with money who might not have the assets for CFP level planning. Thanks. Hoping today I'll finally learn something. Thanks for the question, Abby. Financial coaching, OG, what do you think? I don't think that there's anything wrong with that at all. And as an advisor, you get to decide what type of clients you want to have, right? So there's really no limit to the type of service that you can provide or the work that you can do, who you do it for, or what you charge for it. There's a lot of innovative ways to do that these days. It used to be pretty much the standard. And I'd say that most firms are still at kind of the standard asset management fee, you know, a percentage of the money that they manage. But lately, I've seen a lot of different combinations of things like uh, income plus net worth calculations or flat monthly retainers or something like that. So if you can define a way to do it profitably, there's no limit to to the work that you can do. That's the difficult part for me is is doing it profitably because sadly what you see most financial planners do is they start off with a lot of heart like Abby's talking about with people that really need the help. But when you find the people that can really afford the help as you're trying to improve your own income statement, right? Those end up being people that frankly need your help less, which is frustrating, which is which is really, really frustrating. Because there were people that I would love to spend time with and my practice before I stopped being a financial planner just got to the point where just the economics of the people that I needed to hire to help me with financial planning and for me to live the lifestyle I wanted to live. I couldn't afford to do it anymore, which was, yeah. which was really, really, you know, I'm making lifestyle decisions, not just for my client, but also for myself. Well, and like I said, I think nowadays there's a lot more flexibility in that space. You could do something uh, just popped in my head right now. Why don't you do like a group type of deal? Right. Yeah. So instead of trying to do one-on-one -on -one coaching where you're giving away an hour of your time, but you're trying to figure out how to do it at a low enough rate that you can help people that need help, but at a high enough rate so you don't go bankrupt doing it, put 20 people in a room or do a webinar or something like that where you know you can charge a little bit to everybody, but you kind of make it up on- uh, Yeah, form a, form a closed group where people also help each other. I mean, really, and, and I think that's the key to solving that puzzle is uh, try to scale it a little yeah. bit. Yeah, good stuff. And then uh, you know maybe you can have open office hours from X time to Y time. People take advantage of that. If they want to, instead of having, you know, set time frames with every single person, I just can't, I, you know, scalability yep. is the difficult piece of that. Yep. Good stuff. Thanks for the question, Abby. And guess what? She is going to get the greatest money show on earth t-shirt, which is uh, an awesome shirt for calling in. We also get letters down here in the mailbox. Doug just brought down this one for us. He's so pleased with his calendar, man. This letter comes to us from Steve. Steve says, hello there. In spite of the comments, and likely you know G's best efforts. I've been learning some things. My question's about Warren Buffett. He insists that buying an index fund would yield better returns than managed funds, but still holds individual stocks or Berkshire Hathaway. There must be something I'm missing if he's not following his own advice. There must be a reason, but I'm definitely not smart enough to know what it is. Thanks. I definitely enjoy the show. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Warren Buffett has famously told people to buy index funds, and yet he doesn't do it himself. OG, what's the deal? Uh, those who can't do teach. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, Warren, that Warren, he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know a darn thing. Here's the difference is that this is all he does. Setting aside for a second the fact that he started doing this, you know, 80 years ago or whatever, 60, 50 years ago. And uh, frankly, ETFs and mutual funds, well, there were a few mutual funds around at the time, but there's no such thing as index funds, you know, 50 or 60 years ago. And most people did buy individual stocks. Setting aside the fact that also he owns such large percentages of companies that any sort of movement that he does with those positions would have a material impact uh, to the market as a whole. I think the big difference is that this is all he does every day, all day, 365 days a year for the last 60 years. And when you do that and you commit your life to that, I don't see that there's anything wrong with building an investment portfolio that's not an ETF or index portfolio, right? Or a mutual fund portfolio. But the reality is, is that unless you're a professional investor, you don't have 50, 60 hours a week to devote to the craft, nor do you have the time 
the big difference I think between a regular investor and Warren, not <laughs> notwithstanding the uh, extra zeros he has on his net worth statement, is that he's got all the time in the world to wait for a good deal. And when he finds a good deal, he's got all the money in the world to deploy toward it, right? So you look back to like 2008, during the big recession, he had all this money sitting on the sidelines in cash and started making all sorts of just crazy offers to all these banks, right? Bank of America and Goldman Sachs, to name a few, saying, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the 10 billion you need, but here's what I want in return. I want 8% interest and I want this and I want that. Well, he can make that deal because he's got the 10 billion sitting in cash. You don't get to call Goldman Sachs and say, hey, so I've got my 11 grand in my slush fund that I'm ready to invest. What do you guys think about giving me some rights to buy stocks in the future? It's like, you, you know, you can't, you can't offer that sort of value. So for a regular investor hiring an outside professional, whether that's a mutual fund or an ETF is just going to save you time because you don't have the resources necessary to, to devote both time wise and also financially to, uh, to make big moves on in those individual positions. At the risk of mentioning the same book, two shows in a row, if you read stock market wizards, you'll see exactly, Oh gee, to your point, how much time these pros put into their portfolio. And part of it is really exciting. And part of it made me think, this is a full-time job, you know? And um, I think the reason why so many people don't beat the stock market is partly because they don't treat it like a full-time job. But even if they do treat it like a full-time job, you look at professional money managers. And while a lot of people think professional money managers are idiots, and that's why they can't beat the market, part of it has to do with the way that they get paid. They get paid to come close to the S&P 500. They're measured against the S&P 500. And shareholders sue you if you don't stay close to the benchmark that you say that your fund is like. So there's a frustration in active management territory that managers have of, yeah, I'm supposed to be actively managing this fund. And yet my paycheck says that I get highly penalized if I don't just lose by a little. Right. And then yeah. also they're managing tons of money, which materially moves to your point. They can't just move in and out like you and I can. Uh, we can, I could sell a hundred shares of a stock and nobody will ever notice. Yesterday, I bought a hundred shares of Microsoft. Nobody, nobody, that, that didn't affect the market, right? <laughs> no one sent you a note when, whoa, big mover. I'm even talking about it on today's show. Me talking about it on today's show, not going to move the market, right? Oh, Joe bought a hundred shares of Microsoft. I should go probably buy some too, right? Not, yeah. not the case at all. So I think that's Buffett's big point. Buffett's big point is do your job. Don't try to beat the market. Go with the index. Yeah. Yeah. Despite the fact that he's done it rather successfully, he's even said that uh, if you read through his letters, that he feels that a lot of that has to do with just being in the right place at the right time. But, you know, what do they say about luck, right? Preparation I was going to say, opportunity. yeah. Right? I think so. he's being a little humble. I remember reading that. I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. I think. Well, uh, I mean, some of it is. Some of it is luck, right? Where the market goes down 40%. Sure. But then there's also the preparation of, and I have $30 billion sitting in my checkbook that I can write checks to these companies to make really good deals. And I know how to read the balance sheet on a company and know where the opportunity is. Yeah. Right? So there's that too. Uh, thanks for the question, Steve. If you've got a question for the show, send those to me, Joe, at stackybenjamins.com. The better way, actually... If you're going to use the Haven Lifeline, well, I'll tell you the best way. Just head to stackybedjamins.com and on the top of the, the website, it says questions for the show. Click that link and it'll show you all the ways you can get in touch with us. Hey, if you're ready to get serious about your money, guess what? OG's taking clients. And that means that if you head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash letter O, letter G, you can begin to get your financial house in order the way that it probably should be. Good time thinking about that now that tax day's over. And uh, we're getting close to summer. Get things on the right track so you can enjoy your summer. Uh, thanks to Lillian Karabik. Well, you know what? Doug's going to thank everybody also. So, Doug, tell us what we should have learned today. Yeah, sure thing. No problem, Joe. I'll tell everybody what they should have learned today first. Take some advice from Lillian Karabik's story. Don't have what you want from your money? Give classes, work jobs, and create it. Not only will you get what you want, but you might end up having more fun. Second, banking fees? Maybe it's time to check your statement and see how much you're really being charged. But the big lesson? 
Don't show Joe's mom your new crazy holiday calendar because she'll highlight all the ones that have to do with her so you take her to the Sizzler. Mother's Day? Come on, woman, that's a stretch. Who comes up with these things? Special thanks to Lillian Karabayek for joining us on today's show. You'll find Lillian's Oh My Dollar podcast wherever you're listening to this show. Thanks to TransferWise for sending us your study on banking fees. You can find out more at TransferWise.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I really thought doing these credits completely naked would have been a lot more fun than it actually was. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. I saw this movie, you know, we had a really short moat this year, the really short time of bad movies. And actually we've had some good movies out that I just, I can't, I don't like movies that this could be funny, but I don't like movies that scare me. So this movie, the, the quiet place movie, the right. suspension, I just don't want to see it. <laughs> I, just, I just don't want to. I saw, I don't know, it was a video or a story. Somebody was telling me about the, uh, I guess the whole movie, the whole movie is quiet. Yeah. Somebody said, told so me they be in a packed theater and there's going to be the guy going. <laughs> I saw the I saw the Facebook post from somebody on the other end of that that said they felt horrible because the movie started and they got there right as it started and they had a full thing of popcorn. And every time he took a bite of his popcorn, he felt like the biggest jerk in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a family guy episode or something, right? But the movie's getting great reviews. I just, and everybody I know that's seen it has said, man, it's a good movie, but uh, not, not for me. But I did go see this. I had to drive to the uh, artsy theater in Shreveport to see this. This is a new film out called The Death of Stalin. investigate should you shut the f up before you get us both killed stalin's dead he's dead stalin is dead oh my god our general secretary is lying in a puddle of indignity yeah, he's feeling unwell clearly i want to make a speech at my father's funeral um no problem technically yes but practically when i said no problem what i meant was no problem Ignore me. Stalin would have wanted the committee as one. All those in favor. Carried you unanimously. We need change. Well, let's see who can mobilize first. Oh, seems to be me. Sneaky little The race has started. We need to start putting together a plan. How can you run and plot at the same time? I have no idea what is going on. I'm the peacemaker. So uh, this is the story of uh, Stalin passing away. And before he passes away, he obviously has this terror regime in place. People worried about dying at the beginning of the movie because of the fact that 
Stalin wants to hear the national orchestra play and they forgot to record it. So the guy who's supposed to be recording it, but didn't think Stalin was going to want this one is in a panic. And he gets a bunch of uh, people off the street back in the theater, finds a new conductor because the first conductor had already gone home, gets enough of the musicians back to make it sound good enough, does the whole thing again. uh, So he doesn't get shot by Stalin and uh, the movie goes, goes from there. This stars a lot of people that you've seen before. Steve Buscemi plays uh, Nikita Khrushchev. Jeffrey Tambor plays Georgi Malenkov, who took over right away. He was the deputy secretary underneath Stalin. What's funny is Stalin, of course, wanted a yes man as his right-hand man, so he's immediately the guy in charge, and he's clueless. You heard in the clip there somebody say, I have no idea. Just ignore me. I have no idea what's going on. That's Jeffrey Tambor playing now the new head of the government. Jason Isaacs is a name that you might not know, but you see him as bad guys all over the place. Here he's the head of the Russian army. He's he's the guy, if you watch The Patriot, Mel Gibson's The Patriot, if you watch The Patriot, he's that British general that you just hate, the black-haired general that's just the nastiest, meanest yeah. general. He's, he's that guy. Now you know exactly what I'm talking about. You see him all the time. I just, the name Jason Isaacs isn't one that, uh, that, that you... Uh, that you see a lot. Michael Palin uh, also is in this film. It is, the film's a romp. I laughed a lot during it because it is, uh, it's terrifying. I mean, people just get killed for no reason. Just, just randomly get killed. And that part's horrible. But then it's almost like Catch-22 where everything that's going on is so absurd and makes absolutely no sense that, that you're, as everybody's trying to, go for power now that Stalin's dead and he had such an iron fist that all of his deputies who got along great before he died all of a sudden are stabbing each other in the back to get power and the family comes into the the action and so I I laughed I was horrified and ultimately I didn't care I just I got I got through the movie and I thought I didn't care about that at all and the, the, in fact, the lights came up and, and Cheryl looks at me and goes, that was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was just, it's just, and she was laughing too. She was laughing. She was squirming. I just didn't care about any of the characters. I didn't care that I knew Khrushchev was going to win. Right. I, I, I knew where it was headed. So I knew Steve Buscemi was going to be the guy there at the end. And uh, the horrifying stuff that happens all the way through didn't really care. There were no good guys. Everybody was slimy. It almost was the same reason why I stopped watching House of Cards after a while. And I and I was thinking, why haven't I gone back to House of Cards? Like, you know why? Because I hate everybody. I just, I don't like any of the characters. And it's hard for me to stay latched in to a series where there's just nobody that I yeah. have any... Res- I, I only made it through season three of that. That was me too. I think they got four, five, and six out, but... Yeah. It, yeah, can't do it. So, so Death of Stalin... Uh, thumbs down. On, thumbs down. On the, lots of names that you see. The trailer looks like it's really funny. And it is funny, by the way. It is funny. And, it, and it's sad to say it's funny while they're shooting people for no reason. And you know what really happened, right? Like, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm, I am laughing as I'm watching people get killed and it happened in real life and it's horrifying. And that also made me feel horrible um, because I kind of wasn't sure what the people making the movie were trying to get. Because clearly they're making me laugh because of the way that they set up the situation, but I'm laughing as people are dying. And I'm thinking, why, why am I cracking up about this? You know? Um, yeah, not a good movie. Hey, uh, something that I, two quick things that I saw recently, uh, chef's table season four is out. Just started watching that. Fantastic. I saw episode one. I know. <laughs> Killer. Don't you want to go to New York city right now? Don't you? It is so and like, just go eat pastries. So amazing. Is that the most likable woman on earth? I think so. Oh my <laughs> God. Yeah. Like, like she says serious stuff with a smile on her face. You right. know, I mean the whole time she's talking about serious business decisions. She's got a smile on her face going, going, who doesn't like cookies? <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so that one was really good. And then I saw on, I don't know, on iTunes or something like that, the uh, murder on the Orient Express. Yeah. Re- and I gave reboot. it. I, I know you've said you like that a whole bunch. I, I didn't know the movie. I got a, I, I, I gave it kind of a thumb sideways to up. I liked it a lot. I thought it was very pretty. I thought it was interesting. Um, Partially because I didn't know the story. Yeah. Right. So I didn't know what happened at the end. Right. The whole time I, you know, it's a whodunit, right? So you're yeah. trying to figure out who did it. Did you think and that was the solution, though? No. 
Yeah. No, they did a good job. Yeah. No, they did. Yeah. I thought it was just a beautiful movie. I thought it was Great. so well shot. Man, yep. just the scenery and the, uh, I don't know, the, the, the colors. It was just a very colorful mm-hmm. movie. Good stuff. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Hey, hey, uh, hey, no, 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 no. One more thing. Check out what I got. I put this on our Instagram feed, on our Stacky Benjamin's Instagram feed. But uh, if you're not following us there, I got this in the mail yesterday from our new friend, Nick, in Australia. Nick wrote me to tell me he Good was- day, mate. Wrote me to say he was doing this. I finally got that right. I know. I know. And check this out. Seven years. Stacking Benjamins, the card game. All right. So what it's a it? it's a beautiful little tin, and there's some cards inside. And uh, he he sent me the rules separately, so there's there's no rules with it. But each of the cards has different symbols on it, and there's symbols like uh, that's funny. He's got the old green room. He's got uh, you. He's got uh, Greg McFarlane on here. Paula, Doug, but anyway, each of the cards has different people on it, and I don't know how to play. I'm about to learn how to play, but thanks. <laughs> Nick put together a, a card game based on Stacking Benjamins and sent it to me. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll try this out, OG. All right. Thanks a ton, Nick, and uh, we'll see everybody next time. <laughs>